So I'm David Becker with the Pew Charitable Trust. I'm here to talk to you all about elections in the United States and how they're run. Now, it's not something many of us think about, except for about every four years when a presidential election is held. But I'm sure many of us were watching television late at night in November, watching those voters in Florida stay in line until about 2 a.m. to cast their ballot. And many of us were probably thinking, how the heck does this happen? In fact, someone in Washington who works in government came up to me after that, and he said, I've got this great idea. Why don't we make elections more like Jiffy Lube? I thought, okay, um, go on. And um, he said, no, no, hear me out. So before Jiffy Lube, oil changes were a big pain. They took a long time. They were a hassle. And then Jiffy Lube came around with this great model, and everything was efficient and cost-effective. It took only 15 minutes, and your oil change was over. And I said to him, that's a great idea. Elections are exactly like oil changes. If everybody in the United States got an oil change on the exact same day, every four years, in a building that was never meant for oil changes, performed by someone who had never seen the underside of a car and was being paid less than minimum wage. That's one of the challenges we face with elections in the United States. And we at Pew have been working on this challenge for several years, trying to figure out a way to make elections run more effectively, more efficiently, to serve voters better. And in our research, we discovered one of the single biggest problems in election administration are the voter lists. That might surprise some of you. We don't really think about voter lists all that much. But in the United States, as you know, in order to cast a ballot, you need to get on a list and make sure your information is up to date or you might have problems. I bet many of you have had problems at the polls after a move. And in fact, that's the number one reason the voter lists are such a challenge, mobility. About one in eight Americans moves in any given year, and that rate is double amongst young Americans. The mobility, the churn in the voter lists makes it very difficult to keep up to date. And this leads to problems on the lists. What we know is about, at any given point in time, about 12.7 million records from our research are out of date at any given point in time. And about 2.7 million individuals have records in more than one state. Now, that's not because of any kind of voter fraud. The reason is because someone naturally moves to another state, does their duty and registers to vote, wants to participate, but the state they move from never hears about it. This is a big problem for those states. And then, of course, the most highly mobile voters of all, dead people. About 1.8 million dead people are still on the list because election officials don't have the tools to find those people and accurately take them off and to make sure they don't take people who aren't dead off the list accidentally. Adding to this problem is that voters don't really understand how voter lists work. About one in three voters thinks that their voter registration just magically automatically updates when they move. It does not. And then adding to the confusion, voters don't realize that they can update their information in a motor vehicles agency when they're going to update their driver's license at the same time. Again, these challenges compound to make maintaining the voter list more and more of a problem. Between 2012 and the next presidential election in 2016, activity will move along at a fairly regular pace for voter registration. Most people don't think about voter registration until right before a presidential election, and then bam. A month before a presidential election, most of the registration activity takes place. So you're an election official. Imagine how challenging this is for you to run this as a business. And compound that with the fact that most voter registrations are done by paper. So all of that activity that takes place in that 30 or so days before a presidential election is coming in paper form. And you have to process all of that at your busiest time when you're doing all of these other things to make sure elections go off without a hitch. And so you need to find people to decipher the illegible handwriting and put it into the database. And this creates tremendous challenges for election officials. The result is a system that's not particularly efficient and doesn't do really what we need it to do. This is a good example. Consider two voters, one living across the Michigan and Indiana border from the other. If you live in Michigan and you fill out a voter registration form, you're almost 100% going to have that form processed. But the person who lives just over the state line in Indiana has about a in one in four chance of making sure that their voter registration gets onto the list. And this happens all over the United States because our system is not very modern and doesn't use data in a very good way. The result of this inefficient system 
can be seen in the statistics. About 24 million registrations are out of date or inaccurate at any given point in time. In 2012, about 1.2 million votes were lost due to voter registration problems. People going to the polling place thinking they can vote and having a problem getting a ballot that they can cast that will be counted. And then for all that, about one in four of our eligible citizens is not registered to vote. It's about 51 million citizens in the United States who aren't on any list at all. So I work for the Pew Charitable Trust. This is the kind of persistent problem we love to work to solve. And so we started looking at this problem, doing the research. How could we fix this problem? We decided to put a team of experts together. We brought election officials from the state and local level from all over the country who had been working on this problem for decades. We brought academics who'd been doing research in this field for decades. But we thought about it and we realized this might not be just a policy problem. It might also be a technology problem. And so we needed to find someone who could help walk us through some of the technology that might help us solve this problem. So I'd heard about this guy, Jeff Jonas, from IBM. Jeff came into this group and provided the spark that ultimately led to the solution that we implemented. Jeff's going to tell you about that right now. <clears throat> well, let me tell you about my side of the story. I get this call that says, how would you like to come uh, be part of a working group and be involved in a report? <laughs> oh, the joy. So I, I'm going to these meetings. I'm with all these, um, uh, these, this, these people that he's gathered together. And I'm hearing the same story I hear with lots of organizations. Each organization's having difficulty making sense of their own data. They're having difficulty figuring out how it relates to other data in the ecosystem, in this case, the other states. And to me, it's about making higher quality predictions. They, they just needed more context. Well, you know, just to be clear, when I say context, what do I mean? I mean to better understand something by taking into account the things around it. When you see the word bat in a sentence, you look at the words around it to know what kind of bat it is. But when it comes to this particular problem that I was hearing about, you have these two individuals. This individual has moved. The names are similar. The date of births are the same. Nothing else is similar. But you can't just record match these and figure out it's the same person. But luckily, states have access to DMV data. So in this case, the Maryland DMV record has the same name, address, date of birth, and driver's license, and therefore you can assert it's the same. And in Maryland, you've learned the social security number for the voter. And the same goes with Virginia. Here the name, address, date of birth, and driver's license are the same, and here you learn a social. Now both sides of this have the same name, date of birth, and social security number, and you can make an assertion this is actually the same person. When you realize that your Maryland voter and the Virginia voter are the same people, you can do something like inform Maryland that their voter may have moved. And in fact, if they hadn't registered in Virginia, then the, th the prediction that you could make is you should make two recommendations. Tell Maryland the voter may have moved, and at the same time tell Virginia they may have a new, a new voter. And so the technology we've been using for this is G2. I've been working on it for four and a half years. It's only been public, uh, publicly known for the last two and a half years. And from a G2 point of view, um, all these data sources are really, it's just about an observation space. It's about your organization's observation space. In the case of elections, it's voters, it's DMV, it's deceased persons. I have many customers that try to keep the dead dead. So you, you load the deceased persons. And in election business, it's important because I think it's only legal in three states for dead people to vote. <laughs> okay, I'm rounding up. Um, <clears throat> So from the point of view of an observation space, um, what happens is as data flies into me, it's like puzzle pieces, that's my metaphor, it holds up pretty well. And when that occurs, this is the story of data finds data. And as fast as data finds data, you're figuring out, because you have a more complete picture, what is relevant to who. So one of the things I've been doing in G2 is I've been baking in something called privacy by design. I do a lot of work with the privacy community. I sit on advisory boards and boards and I'm trying to build more privacy into my systems. And I've, I've built seven privacy features into uh, G2, and one of them is called selective anonymization. Here, you know, the state has this information, the name and address are public record, but the driver's license, social, and date of birth, that's personally identifiable. Boy, if you didn't have to share that, you wouldn't want to, but you need to, to get really high quality entity resolution. So with selective anonymization, the states anonymize it. Did you see a wiggle? Eh? The states anonymize it, 
changing the driver's license, social, and date of birth into a form that's not human readable and not mathematically reversible. It's called a one-way hash. And we actually hash it and anonymize it before they even send it. And by the way, if you don't, haven't heard of a one-way hash, the Reader's Digest version is as follows. If I took a pig and a grinder and, and made a sausage, if I gave you the grinder and the sausage, could you make a pig? <laughs> right. That's a one-way hash. <laughs> OK. And so what happens is it gets anonymized, and then it shoots into the data center. And this whole notion is uh, really about context accumulation. This is, I, I think this G2 technology is going to become known as one of the first kinds of technology. It's real context-aware computing. It's, it's exciting to uh, have it play the role that it's playing in, in various projects, and particularly this one. And, and David is now going to tell you about what, it's, what the results were. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so fast forward about 18 months, and we now have a set of seven states who are really interested in participating in this project. And we built something called the Electronic Registration Information Center, or as we like to call it, ERIC powered by G2. And what ERIC does is it allows election officials in these states to keep voter lists that are more accurate, more cost effective, and make the process more efficient and serve their voters better. I'm going to give you an example of how that worked in 2012. So in just these seven states, the largest of them is Virginia in terms of population, so none of them is particularly huge. But ERIC identified 5.7 million eligible citizens who are not yet on the voter list in those states, enabling those states to reach out to those voters, not hours or days before the voter registration deadline, but weeks and maybe a month before the voter registration deadline. And this enabled them to control the pace of voter registration better and tamp down that spike that we saw and maybe turn it into a little more of a plateau. In addition, it enabled them to direct as much of this activity to highly efficient online registration, which is now offered in 13 states and more states are starting to develop it, which is much more accurate, much more efficient and beloved by the voters, and also happens to be a lot more cost effective. So we had 300,000 new registrants in 2012 as a result of this, of this program. Let me give you an example of how this is more cost effective. The cost to process a paper registration form in the United States is about 83 cents. You can understand why. You've got to hire people to translate uh, that illegible handwriting and then enter it into a database, often crunched into that 30-day period right before the election. But to process an online voter registration form, it only costs three cents on average. Huge savings for taxpayers and government that result from this, and it also happens to be a system that's more accurate and effective. So what we've seen from working on this project together is a system that better performs, is more efficient, is more cost effective, is um, something that voters like a lot, lot more. And what election officials in those states were able to do is build a better democracy.